Um, Brian is a partner at Healthcare, uh, Fraser Healthcare Partners, as I mentioned. He is on the firm's buyout team. Fraser is one of the first healthcare-focused investment firms. They cover the life cycle of companies from helping create them to giving venture capital for them to begin to grow, to growth capital, to buy out, um, all the way through leverage, uh, re leveraged recapitalizations. Brian's work is on the buyout team, and they focus on um, investing in profitable healthcare services companies, pharmaceutical companies, and medical product companies. Brian is on several boards, of course. A few of them are Correct Care Solutions, Informed Medical Communications, Orthotic Holdings, and Matrix Medical Network. And Brian leads Fraser's debt capital market activities. So that's a little bit about Brian, and now he will take it away. All right. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Melissa, and thanks for the intro on Fraser. Just uh, maybe a couple more points uh, on us. We manage about $3 billion in total and have been focused exclusively on healthcare uh, since 1991. Um, and in going through uh, this presentation, as I put together, I think one of the themes out there is, you know, these are, these are hard problems and these are problems that people have been working on for, for many cycles of investment. And the exciting thing that you're going to hear about today from some of our panelists and some of the others is what changes is we get more tools and we get uh, the opportunity to use new tools to tackle old problems. So I'm going to talk about a framework of the problem in general, uh, give you some uh, my point of view of some of the dynamics in the industry for the large groups, i.e. hospitals, payers, patients, and physicians. Uh, and then at the end, talk a little bit about technology and innovation. And throughout the presentation, you know, anytime you hear the words problem, anytime you hear the, the words solution or trend, these are the areas that we look to for investment, and those are the areas as you're thinking about what, what's the opportunity for change uh, and innovation, those are the types of areas I would focus on uh, through this presentation, and hopefully this will pr provide a baseline uh, for the discussion, not only this panel, but uh, for the rest of the day. Um, I will give a disclaimer. Uh, having been in healthcare long enough, there's always a counter example and a counter statistic, so um, don't hold me to anything here. These are, uh, this is my point of view, um, but there's certainly regional differences and there's always an exception, uh, but hopefully this will uh, start a good discussion for the day. So uh, here's what I want to talk through. Uh, we'll talk about the problem and solution at a high level, talk about the dynamics, as I mentioned, and then we'll talk a little bit about technology and innovation. Um, so what is the problem? We all know what the problem is. Uh, the healthcare cost is too high. Um, we also know why it's too high. It's end-of-life care, it's chronic disease, it's waste. Um, you know, if you, if you speak to hospital executives, the general consens consensus is about 30% of what they do is wasteful. So we know all this. Uh, the other thing we know that, you know, it's not the 80-20 rule in healthcare, i.e. 80% of the costs are from 20% of the members. It's actually the 55. 50% uh, of the costs are from 5% of the patients. So it's incredibly focused in terms of where the problems are. Not only do we know the problem, we actually know the solution. It's things, uh, you know, on this list. Palliative care. Uh, best practices in evidence-based medicine, uh, medication management and adherence. If you talk about hosp uh, hospital rehospitalizations, massive percentage of those are the fact that when a patient leaves the hospital, they don't go to the pharmacy, they don't get on their medications, and they're back in the hospital. So huge, huge solution if we can do that. Narrow networks, uh, using physician extenders, so you can have a doctor and extend the number of patients that they can treat by using extenders, and whether that's nurse practitioners, uh, techs, or technology. Uh, lower cost setting, doing things out of the hospital, doing it in a surgery center, doing it in a physician's office, or doing it in the home. Huge opportunity for savings. Preventative medicine, uh, patient engagement, uh, this is one of the, the biggest things. You know, imagine if um, we could get everyone to stop smoking, drinking, to start exercising and eating well. That would help our, our healthcare system. But, you know, this is, this is hard to do. 
um, medical directives, and then coordinated care. And you're going to hear about some of this stuff today. And interestingly, we were chatting. You know, we didn't coordinate our talks today, but I think you'll see there's some nice overlap, um, and hopefully that uh, brings some interesting uh, thought for you guys. Um, so we know the problem. We know the solution. So what's the problem? It's really, really hard to do this, and why? Um, the first thing, and, and where we sit right now, you're seeing it writ large, you know, this concept of repeal and replace. What that means to folks like ourselves is, we don't know what the rules of the game are gonna be. How is the system going to be set up? How are things gonna get paid for? We don't know right now. Uh, and that makes this really hard to make a new investment, go in a new direction when six, nine, 12 months, there may be an entirely new regime out there. Uh, so that's uh, just an overall backdrop that's hard. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. One person's waste is another person's revenue. So when we're talking about you know, not doing a CT scan because you know, the evidence uh, suggests that it's not going to change the treatment plan, well, guess what? That's somebody's revenue. And, and they have a vested interest in having that CT scan being done. So we've got a very integrated and tough scenario here where when you talk about being cheaper, you're talking about somebody making less money. Um, identifying the 5% is a really hard job, not only uh, who they are now, but who, who they will be. Um, and hopefully we'll hear maybe a little bit from uh, Imad about big data and how that can help us there. Uh, the system is siloed. You know, this concept of specialists and the concept of the nursing home and the pharmacy and the hospital and the physician, they don't talk to each other. And even trying to navigate all of the, all of the players uh, is very difficult. Talk about inertia. You know, we've been in a fee-for-service regime for so long. Um, California is certainly on the forefront of being in a managed care scenario, but if you look at the system broadly, you know, there's just a lot of inertia about doing things the way we've always done it. And so being disruptive is hard because there are a lot of uh, existent wall, existing walls that make that tough. Um, Getting into the personal, cultural, socioeconomic, socioeconomic and religious reasons. Uh, you think about things like hospice. Um, in areas of the country with uh, lower socioeconomic and higher religious affinity, the acceptance of hospice is much lower because it is viewed, frankly, as an unacceptable or un-American thing to do. Um, that's a huge burden or a huge boulder to get through. Political, uh, this is one of my favorites, going back to one man's waste is another's uh, revenue. The biggest cost here is in the hospital. And so if we're really gonna address this, we need to reduce the amount we spend on hospital. Um, if I gave you a guess, who's generally the second largest employer in any given area? It's the hospital. So is the politician gonna be wanting to say, I'm gonna close the hospital? No. So it's a very tough political issue to think about how we reduce cost. Um, liability, uh, we talked a, a lot about there's always an exception, certainly local regional differences. Frankly, what, what works in Southern California does not work in rural, uh, you know, Idaho. Uh, and so we really need to think about that. Um, you know, med medicine as an art and a science, you, you know, when we talk about standardization, when we talk about um, evidence-based medicine and protocols, you know, we're doing something that's saying, hey, let's do something the same every time. Whereas we, we teach medicine and the, the practitioners of medicine, they think about, I'm with an individual patient and I'm using my judgment. So how do you, how do you work with those two uh, countervailing factors? Um, and then finally, you know, it's nice to talk about all of this, but at the end of the day, we are ultimately talking about a relative, a friend, or yourself. And you know, my own personal experience, you know, I've spent 17 plus years in healthcare investing and understand the benefits of hospice. Doesn't make it any more, you know, heart-wrenching when I had to make the decision to, you know, take my mother from treat and recover to palliative care, and we're on a path now to the, the next phase. So it's very difficult uh, to do these things. 
So let me talk now about the dynamics in the big players. And again, top side here are some of the dynamics, the bottom side are some of the implications, and then as you think about trends and outlooks and areas for investment, these are some of the areas that you'll want to focus on. I'd say the biggest thing over the last few years is this concept of accountable care organizations and moving from fee-for-service to some form of outcomes-focused or risk-taking. And you see potential there, it goes back to the uncertainty. Um, what system we're gonna be in, we're not quite sure. Incredible investments in existing infrastructure, they've got a fear of losing the referral, they have this question of how do they partner with downstream providers. Um, and the other interesting thing is you, if you ask a hospital system today, by and large, they probably had the best two years in history in terms of profitability under the ACA, and what are, what are they doing with that money? So related to the fear of referral, they're buying physician groups. We've heard this before. It hadn't, hasn't worked in the past. We'll see if it works this time. Uh, they are looking to directly ally with uh, large self-insured, so for example, Boeing in Seattle is partnered directly with the hospital system and essentially cutting the insurers out, um, doing a lot of outsourcing and joint venturing of assets. And then what's interesting is that some of them are still building more beds, and when we go back to what the solution is, we don't need more hospital beds, but that's the, uh, the system that we're in. Um, what are the patients facing? Obviously, it's healthcare inflation, incredible complexity of the system, of their benefits, uh, of pricing. Uh, newer patients today, and I'm talking about, call it the 20s to 30 year olds, have much less loyalty to their physician. This concept of the family physician is really not something that's happening these days. Those folks are embracing technology and this concept of healthcare on demand, minute clinics, going to the corner, urgent care, signing up on your phone. That's a, that's a very new dynamic that's happening. Um, Patients are making buying decisions, uh, and then you know there there finally is some concept of healthcare trade-offs, i.e., choice equals uh, uh, there's a cost to choice, and so you know what if I want any doctor, I'm going to have to pay more. These are trade-offs that patients haven't haven't historically internalized, but is starting to happen. Payers, um, I just talked about self-insureds going directly with hospitals, so fear of disintermediation. Um, how to react to and pay for innovation, and here I'm talking mainly about therapeutic innovation. Um, member migration, you know, we have members, or we, the payers, have members, maybe with me for the first year, and then they're gone for the next year. Do I invest in preventative care if that uh, member is going to be going to another plan? How do they influence the pen? Um, they have the medical loss ratio minimums, again, in the current status, and then the 550, which is driving all of the costs. What are they doing? What are the areas of uh, investment and opportunity as it relates to the payers? It's analytics. It's finding these patients today and identifying who is going to be an expensive patient uh, down the road. There's benefit design to high deductible uh, that we've talked about. Um, this concept of subcap risk. So how can I partner with, for example, a hospital or an orthopedic group that's going to give me one price and take the risk on all those hips and knees? That's a big opportunity. And then it's care coordination of this 5%. And these are the folks that are in and out of hospitals, have this entirely siloed healthcare experience, and the costs are spiraling. That's a big focus for the payers. Uh, physicians, I uh, hear these fears, fears of getting left out. You know, hospitals are buying physician groups, and what if I don't get bought? Um, complexity of doing business as a single practitioner is almost impossible these days with uh, regulation, licensure, uh, billing, collecting, contracting, the IT investment, we're talking about technology, CapEx, and then back to the fact that the patient is changing and has uh, much less loyalty. What's happening in the physician world? Searching for scale, so you're seeing these aggregations of derm businesses, opto businesses, orthopedic groups, uh, you pick it, radiology. Physicians are coming together to get heft so they can address some of these things. Focusing on revenue, going back to waste. This is a, a, an area that folks want revenue, but are they doing it in an appropriate manner? And thinking of their business as a retail business, uh, which is again new for physicians. 
Um, so just a couple words on technology and innovation, and we'll get on to the rest of the panel. Um, so promise and limits of technology, you know, we're probably in the 20th year of the electronic record uh, revolution. Um, it's taken a very long time. I think the, the key here is digital does not equal data, and it hasn't for many years. But I think we are finally at a precipice where we've got enough of the data in a way that is manipulatable that we can now do something with it. And hopefully we'll hear uh, about some of these things. That big data is incredible. It can help us identify and predict this concept of who are the 5%. It can suggest best practices. Um, the big question about big data, though, is it can't implement. So it needs to be a part of the broader healthcare system, and it's a great tool, but it needs to be implemented appropriately. And how do we structure the system such that we can use those tools? Similarly with technology, um, it can sometimes uh, improve workflow. I think if you ask folks over the last 15 or 20 years how their implementation worked, they probably would say it hurt workflow. Um, it can add transparency, reduce fr friction costs, uh, but again, can't do it all by itself. And so we need to come up with a coordinated answer using these new tools to really uh, address the issues. Um, and then uh, talk a little bit here about innovation. You know, we're in the arts and sciences building. You know, a lot of people think about innovation as new therapeutics, new diagnostics, new technologies. Melissa, you gave a different definition of innovation, which, again, you know, we didn't coordinate, but I, I really like the way this panel has come together. You know, innovation can take many forms, benefit design, care delivery, system design, and these are the integrated areas that we need to be focused on. Um, and let me talk a little bit about traditional innovation because it, it's an area that people see um, and certainly with our venture fund we're investing in, in this type of an area. But you know, luckily this industry has matured. Uh, we used to invest in drugs and the big aha was you can take the drug once a day versus four times a day. Um, you, you can argue that's good for adherence and all those sorts of things, but you know, that's sort of a small incremental uh, innovation. Right now, most venture investing on the life sciences side is focused on immunotherapeutics, orphan drugs, oncolytics, anti-infectives, vaccines. These are new breakthrough opportunities from a uh, life sciences perspective. The, they're driving tremendous investments uh, and tremendous returns in the industry, but they also cost a lot. And you know, how do we think about innovation of this sort relative to the expense? What are we going to pay for? What is appropriate? Uh, I think one of the, the greatest examples that's a, a public health question is uh, hep C. So this is a disease, a chronic disease, but in many cases doesn't present any symptoms for 20 years. <coughs> Should we pay $90,000 today to cure that disease that may not present for 20 years? That's a big health policy question, and it goes into the cost. Um, who should pay for it? Who should get it? And you know, the biggest question uh, on these types of things is ultimately does this innovation uh, help solve the cost problem? So hopefully that's a good uh, view from at least where we sit. And uh, for those in the overflow room, there are a lot of seats here. So come on in, the water's warm. Thank you.